Gaijin Entertainment presents The Shooting Range You're watching The Shooting Range, a weekly show for all tankers, airmen, and aspiring captains in War Thunder. In this episode, The Stepped Goes Fasta How a British motorboat changed the fate of the early Soviet motorboat fleet. Mosquito, not Mosquito, the German take on the wooden night fighter. Hotline, the developers answer questions that you left in the comments. But first, let's start with the first tank in the game will be fully functional autoloader, the Cheery 2. Let's start with the problems, and there is quite a long list actually. That's only natural though, please remember that we're talking about a vehicle that was basically a prototype. Its Japanese creators simply didn't get an opportunity to polish the design up. Problem number one – armor. It's almost flat and can be penetrated by even low-tier vehicles. And there's this thing with the crew – it's quite large, but all your tankers can be incapacitated with a single shot. And the Cheery's maneuverability? Let's say, um, legendary. Legendarily bad. So you want to turn around? Okay, feel free to enjoy some Kabuki theater or read through the Book of Five Rings. It takes ages. Turret traverse speed is also suboptimal, which makes it really hard to fight in close quarters. Simply put, don't hope for too many reaction shots. Talking about shots, the secondary cannon is also not going to win any awards anytime soon. The only armor you can consistently penetrate is that metal thing that's protecting anti-aircraft guns. And you won't always deal a lot of damage, as its ammo has very little explosive effect after penetration. What's the deal then? Well, the selling point of this tank is obviously its gun. It's punchy and has exceptional burst damage potential with three shots available for instant delivery. Yeah, after that you'll have to survive through the longest reload ever, but does not matter if you already sent your enemies to their hangars? Not even the toughest vehicles are safe if the Cheery is calling the shots. At the same time, the tank has great gun depression. Feel free to find yourself a good position somewhere in the hills and shoot at your enemies from the relative safety of the high ground. A few tips. Never, never engage enemy one-on-one. -on -one. This is not a Rambo tank. Get squatted up, move from cover to cover, and never get away from your team. Don't stay in the open, take no unnecessary risks. Always have a contingency plan. And above all, don't rush. Happy hunting, Heishi! Sometimes a mistake can have consequences that lasts for decades. And sometimes you can just blame the British. On the dawn of August 18, 1990, the calm that engulfed the heavily fortified Kronstadt harbor was suddenly disrupted. A torpedo smashed into the hull of the battleship Andrei Pervozvanny, another, sank a submarine supply ship, the Pamit Azova. The attackers were a small unit of British coastal motorboats, and a few minutes later, they were gone. The effect of the raid was impressive, to say the least. The battleship was heavily damaged, the Pamia Tozova was done for, while the British lost only three CMBs and a few men. What was equally impressive was that the British motorboats had a top speed of at least 37 knots. They were almost flying above the water surface. Soon, one of the sunk CMBs was recovered from the bay and found itself in the hands of the capable Soviet engineers who examined the boat and reached a conclusion. The motherland needs to have a boat like this. The trick was that the British vessel had both a powerful engine and a step in a hull, a longitudinal notch that helps to reduce drag and friction, allowing the boat to go significantly faster. The Soviet Navy were smitten with these stepped hull bottoms. They wanted it, and they wanted it fast. Easier said than done, though. The first Soviet boats of similar design entered service only in 1933. On the other hand, the project was supervised by Tupolev, a talented aircraft designer, who went all in to make the vessel as fast as possible. The boat, called the G-5, was carrying two torpedoes and was outfitted with a Mikuling AM-34 aircraft engine. It had a stepped hydroplane hull made of a very light alloy called Duralumin 
that was widely used in the aviation industry. As a result, the boat turned out to be really fast and not very seaworthy. Even moderate waves made it very hard for the crew to navigate the seas, and any kind of precision shooting was certainly out of the question. The flaw didn't prevent the G5 from going into production, though. The Soviet press were quick to praise the new superweapon, and it seems the leaders of the Navy didn't question the credibility of these reports. They were genuinely shocked when the Soviet Navy started to lose dozens of G5s early in the war. It turned out that the more traditional German V-bottom boats were consistently coming up on top when facing their Soviet counterparts. German vessels were considerably slower, yes, but they had a better grip on the water and were more predictable. So, that's basically how one British CMB guided the path of the early Soviet motorboats. Thanks, Britain! And now, get ready for another story of engineering madness. Even though Hermann Göring famously promised that no enemy bomber can reach the Ruhr, at the start of the conflict the British didn't hesitate to lay waste the German industrial zones. They probably didn't hear him or something. And while one could tolerate an occasional bomb drop from a Wellington, the appearance of a new generation of fast bombers presented an unforeseen challenge. But that was still manageable. The German ground radars and Luftwaffe bombers converted into night fighters were at least able to detect the all-metal aeroplanes. And now it was a new threat, something fast, something undetectable, something made of wood. Oh yeah, the Mosquito, the wooden wonder. It turned out that its frame presented a relatively weak signature on contemporary radars, which made it nigh impossible to spot these aircraft at night. The design was so effective that some experts even started to talk about a possible renaissance of the wooden planes. Naturally, the Luftwaffe wanted a purpose-built German answer to have a mosquito of their own. In the end, the task was given to Kurt Tank's team at Focke-Wulf. At first, everything was well, the work was progressing ahead of the schedule. But then both administrative issues and technical problems started to surface. Geoffrey D. Haviland, the creator of the Mosquito, knew how to work with wood. His German counterparts had to learn it all anew. Some techniques had to be literally rediscovered. The added weight of the guns and drag of the radar antennas slowed the plane by a full 75 kilometers an hour. And everything had to be recalculated. The designers planned to use an updated Jumo 211R engine, but it failed to impress. It became apparent that the more suitable choice was the more powerful Jumo 213, but it was also heavier. In other words, the team was stuck in development hell. At some point, Kurt Tank almost faced persecution and the whole project was on the verge of collapse. That's when the almighty Erhard Milch, the second man in the Luftwaffe, stepped in. He had a personal grudge against Ernst Heinkel and was ready to do everything in his power to shut down the development of the Heinkel 219. So naturally, he supported the other night fighter variant, the one developed at Focke-Wulf. Milch wanted the TA-154 to get into action as fast as possible. In the end, the aircraft entered production before the designers had time to conduct all flight tests. Against the wishes of Joseph Kamhuber, the general of night fighters, and Kurt Tank himself. What's interesting, it wasn't a bad plane, no sir. It actually could be a true German answer to the British wooden wonder, but the circumstances were against it. Kurt lacked necessary technologies, certain kinds of wood and other resources. And above all, time. Allied air raids on key production facilities didn't speed up the process either. In the end, only around 50 TA-154s were built, and none of them played a serious role in the air fights of the war. But it is still remembered as the only wooden twin-engine German fighter aircraft, and recently this plane became the latest vehicle created by one of our players as a part of our revenue share program. Finally, it's time for the traditional last part of our show, Hotline. Developers answering questions from the comments. Strictly speaking, it's not the most serious-minded section of the show. If you want answers to be given with solemn faces, feel free to appeal to the official forums. Here we have a more light-hearted discussion of the big questions of War Thunder. I hope you like it. 
Riz Collette writes, Hey Gaijin, we cannot move the time cursor on the replace. Is there a way to make the time cursor movable just like a video playback? There are some technical difficulties that prevent us from making such a system, but we're thinking about implementing some kind of flags that you'll be able to return to at any point of time. The second question comes from a player called Sacred Documents. Can you please allow ram kills? You're talking about ground forces, right? Because in the sky, ramming is quite a common tactic, though not the most honorable one. As And as a matter of fact, you can ram in ground forces as well, just not nearly as effectively. Dr. P. Jelly asks, what are the Japanese crew names? I mean, Fritz and Hans, Ivan, who else? Tetsu, Shoji and Yoshi, obviously. And then there's this message from a player called Silver Gaming. Well, this was my first year of War Thunder and it was amazing. It was really fun. Really nice to hear that, mate. We still have a few surprises up our sleeves, so keep your eyes peeled for even more military machinery-related awesomeness. That's it for today, but feel free to write your questions in the comments below. We do read them all, and you might see some of them answered in the next episode. If you like what we're doing, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you on the shooting range!